Welcome to our Impact Wave Short Wave Lasting Impact Podcast Series. I'm Karen Telemelli, and my guest today, live from the Philippines, is Arden Arut. Arden is an adventure and explorer, the first complete solo circumnavigation of the world by human power. First to row the three oceans, Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian, and holds 15 Guinness World Records. Um, welcome, Aridin. When we last spoke, you were just about to embark on this latest adventure, and I've been keeping track uh, through your social media. It's been quite an adventure so far, cycling throughout the Philippines. I'm thrilled to catch up with you and excited to hear about your adventure so far. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'm uh, excited to reconnect. It's been uh, quite the wait here. I am now at the northwest corner of Luzon Island in the Philippines, the biggest island of the Philippines in the north. This is as far north as I can get for a proper launch from here toward hopefully Vietnam. It gives me the positional advantage because uh, the winds, the monsoon winds are still from the northeast generally and that'll try to sweep me southwest. So the farther north I go, the better chance I have of reaching Vietnam, which is my goal, to be able to continue my journey. We uh, brought my rowboat from Legazpi, where I had landed 24th of March in 2022, so last March. And then uh, I had to wait until this time so that I can take it across uh, at the right time of the year. Now uh, the boat had to be put on a truck and brought up here. Before that, I bicycled up here took me uh, 10 days to do that ride from Legaspi. Quite an adventure. Three first three days were in a deluge of uh, rain with creeks overrunning the roads uh, up to my shins, uh, bicycling through mucky water. <laughs> that kind it of was condition. Amazing and then after that, that, it was quite hot from yeah. Manila onward. Yeah, to, uh, heavy uh, rains is was quite an understatement with the flood alerts and broken culverts. I, oh my gosh! Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, but I did have support along the way. JCI International, their branch in Philippines, had uh, various chapters. The JCI is the Junior Chamber of Commerce International, and they are a young, energetic, uh, business-minded folks who tried to make a difference in the community and they decided they were going to support my journey and everywhere I went I found uh, new friends who were expecting me putting up banners <laughs> I got the celebrity treatment all the way to Kurimao where I am right now they even uh, connected me with a senator and they put me on the uh, senator uh, uh, JV, they call him uh, lovingly, and uh, he introduced me to the Senate. I was recognized on the Philippine Senate floor during a live session, and uh, the Senate chairperson and Senator JV came and congratulated me. Uh, and then the next morning, we went bicycling with Senator JV. So yeah, it was just this uh, overwhelming warmth and friendship that I have received in the Philippines, I think I'm going to leave my heart in the Philippines when I leave. Wow. And it's incredible. I, I know um, education is a big part of everything you do and, and the plastic pollution, but your impact, you know, it has such a far reach. I was reading that the senator um, is keen on improving road safety in the Philippines and particularly for cyclists. So, you know, it was so great to have such an impact you know, across the world uh, in so many yes. ways. Yes, and uh, also uh, people have embraced our message of addressing plastic pollution in the ocean. And a 2021 study identified Philippines as the, the leading uh, country in polluting the ocean. They have so many islands, so many products come in packaged, and then there is no proper collection of this refuse. And now we have a problem identified, and we had a fundraiser for the Alba Yacht Club 
in Legaspi on the 3rd of uh, February. I hurried back after I bicycled here and uh, joined that as the keynote speaker. And my message and our overwhelming agreement was that we have to address this plastic pollution. They now have a river coming to the Legaspi waterfront, bringing refuse, and they want to address that. And uh, we were able to escalate that to Senator. He's at attention by uh, efforters and mayors of these coastal towns together to identify best practices and. Uh, We may be having a couple technical difficulties here. Oh, there you are. Okay, I think I'll I am you. going to go away from my. Yeah, I am trying to get away from the noise. They have. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'm getting away from all the noise. It's way a quiet corner of the harbor. <laughs> the dock there. Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Sounds good. Well, th that was amazing to have that kind of impact with the government and the mayors. It's, it's incredible. I think uh, people are aware of the problem. They understand the scope of the problem. They do need that uh, perhaps encouragement, perhaps motivation, perhaps uh, collaboration, whatever you want to call it. I think uh, showing that we understand the problem and we uh, are ready and willing to participate in offering a solution goes a long way. And it motivates folks to uh, take initiative. I think that's uh, being that spark is a very meaningful thing for me. That's why I do what I do. And I think it's been rewarding in that way. If I had any contribution to the solution, I will feel proud. No, that's amazing. And you're right. The, the awareness it is so important. And then getting the community involved and taking the ownership. You know, I, yes. I noticed you posted, um, you had said you went to the um, the fundraiser at the uh, the Yacht Club, but a lovely um, artist, Hazan Maldo, um, painted that it was so beautiful picture on canvas of your rowboat um, yes. guided by the light, but with the ocean littered in plastic. It was a beautiful statement. Um, Quite uh, she was able to capture the message uh, so succinctly. Uh, I think that's what artists do. They cut through the chase. <laughs> yeah. They cut through the clutter and uh, hold us a mirror for us to be able to uh, see ourselves in that image. Exactly. And I noticed you also had the, um, the, the I'm, I'm assuming it's a pleasure of meeting the Turkish ambassador to Manila on your journey. Yes. <laughs> I did. I was able to do that. And hopefully that'll be the same going to other places like Hanoi or wherever I travel through. Um, I am uh, re getting ready to launch by rowboat from where I am now, Kurimao, at the northwest corner of Luzon Island, across the South China Sea toward Vietnam. I'm waiting for the right weather conditions so that I have better chances of reaching Vietnam because right now, Northeast monsoons are still uh, the trend and these Northeast winds mobilize the currents as well towards Singapore and Indonesia. So there's a very good chance that I will be swept farther south than I would like, ending up on Malay Peninsula perhaps 
or as far south as Indonesian islands, which would change my destination depending. I have alternate plans for each of these outcomes. That's how I work my risk assessment <laughs> and decision tree, if you want to call it that, so that uh, I have all these best plans laid out, but of course the ocean is in charge and makes hay of all my plans. That's been the case. If I cannot maintain a westerly course toward Vietnam and I am swept south uh, with the strong currents that run the, along the coast of Vietnam due south, if they sweep me south faster than I'd like, then I have alternate plans and will they will unfold each, uh, but I'm ready for that eventuality. Uh, I do have a team expecting me in Vietnam. What happens beyond Vietnam is a bit of an unknown at this time. I was hoping for a visa from Myanmar to carry on into India and West toward Portugal by bicycle. Myanmar turned down uh, our request with my partner. I have a partner who is ready to bicycle from Vietnam all the way to Portugal with me. He even sublet his home. He relocated as in a waiting mode, holding pattern in Turkey right now. He's also a Turkish uh, of, of Turkish origin. He was born in Cyprus like myself. <laughs> so a kindred spirit. Oh. Uh, he is in Istanbul right now waiting and uh, we are Myanmar turned down our request to bicycle through because they couldn't guarantee our safety they said at the borders uh, they have a military junta in charge the opposition is not holding back there is a low intensity civil war going on so they were concerned as were we I uh, went back to the Chinese embassy in Manila. Uh, Chinese government has turned down all my efforts to obtain a visa ever since March 21, before I launched from Crescent City in California. Uh, due to the pandemic, they had restrictions in place. These uh, restrictions are slowly being lifted, but the response I got from Manila was that they still don't issue visas, tourist visas from Manila. So uh, that leaves me with the, I had, I had choices. I said, okay, I can drop everything, send the boat home, call it done. I can store the boat in Krima, go come back next year, next February. By then either Myanmar or China will relent or just carry on to Vietnam, see what happens. <laughs> So being who I am, I've uh, <laughs> gravitated toward the last option. So I'm waiting for the break in the weather for me to be able to make some progress due west and not get swept too far south. And when I make landfall at Vietnam, hopefully, we will store the boat there. And then uh, my friend will come. We'll both go march up to the doorsteps front steps of the Chinese embassy in Hanoi and <laughs> beg for empathy. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully they will understand, appreciate. Uh, and if we can explain what we're up to, what we're doing in person, uh, it'll ha will have better chance. They may have, the issue is the land borders are more problematic with airline arrivals. They can dictate all right, you got to have all your vaccinations in place. You have to get a uh, COVID test ahead of departure. Uh, the last I checked, they were requiring two tests, antibody tests from two different labs, one 48 hours prior, one 24 hours prior, both to be negative. And now they had these strict requirements. And I, they can impose all those requirements on airline arrivals, but arriving by land, land borders, they don't have labs in place to handle that kind of thing. So they are more restrictive, I, I would understand, I would mm -hmm. assume. So if it comes down to that, as long as we get a visa, I mean, we are prepared to bicycle up to the border, 
take a bus back to the nearest airport, fly into China, rent a car, <laughs> take a bus, whatever, to the border again, and then fist bump the border guards, start bicycling from the border. I mean, we can do all those gymnastics as long as they're willing to give us a visa. Uh, these are the kinds of silliness, silly things we have to do sometimes to stay on the move with these journeys. Uh, you're battling not only nature and seasonal restrictions, you're also dealing with politics, pandemics, wars, yeah. rebellions, civil wars, what have you. Yeah, <clears throat> when you go off on an adventure, there's quite a lot to it, <laughs> more than meets the eye. <laughs> uh, uh, th that's there, there's just so much going on in the background, uh, it's hard to capture all of it. Well, it's, it's lovely to catch up with you. I, I wish you clear sailing and uh, smooth seas um, and on and off the land. Um, but it, it's been wonderful. Before we part, though, um, I do want to, like you had said, you know, you've been raised in Turkey and Turkey and Syria was devastated recently by a 7.8 magnitude earthquake near your mother's hometown. Yes. And just two days ago, Turkey was struck with another 5.2. Um, I, I saw you had mentioned that given the harsh winter conditions, this situation is particularly brutal. If you could speak just for a couple moments on that as well. Uh, yes, it has been a devastating earthquake, 7.8, followed by a 7.5 just eight hours afterwards. Uh, because these uh, Turkey is at the junction of uh, three different tectonic plates. Uh, the Anatolian plate is being pushed due west-northwest by the Arabian plates that's coming and pushing into it. And the Arabian plate is the one that slipped against the Anatolian plate at the fault line that started in Antioch and going northeast from there. And this uh, moves about two centimeters every year and, of, of course, over time. This fault line had accumulated a lot of stress and it hadn't been, uh, that stress hadn't been released or relieved for the last five centuries or so. So it was due to go and popped and it popped violently. And uh, so there was uh, up to six meters of fault movement uh, just shearing along and it brought down a lot of buildings. Uh, they were, shoddy construction a lot of corruption happens even though standards are in place nobody uh, heeds them uh, I don't want to get into <laughs> those details but the price was paid by blood and uh, the government could not mobilize quickly enough the first 24 hours are critical they did not mobilize, no presence was on the ground. Uh, and so basically this hit, this thing hit at 4.17 a.m. in the morning when everybody was in their bed and there was snow on the ground, had winter conditions. Uh, so they got trapped in their beds. And if you don't get to them quickly enough, if they are alive, they will freeze to death, basically. Uh, it was a bad hand that was dealt to all that region. My mother's side of the family is from that area, from the earthquake zone, and they are all alive, but they had to evacuate, get outside, and camp out in their cars for uh, weeks, and then they decided they need to move on. Uh, they relocated to other places because the aftershocks kept coming and any damaged building was liable to collapse. And they have, uh, they have been coming down. Um, a lot of uh, international help arrived uh, and they did what they could. After a while, it came down to using machinery to move concrete blocks that had pancaked on each other or collapsed like a stack of cards right uh, at, at some point you're just digging up what you can and clearing the area uh, 
and yeah. it, it's it's a sad state of affairs. It's going to cost billions of dollars to reconstruct. They're going to have to rethink where they construct these buildings. Uh, Liquefaction was a big factor. One of the hardest hit areas was in the Antioch province of Turkey. There used to be a lake where they filled the lake, drained the lake, and then uh, the lake bed was open to farming. And then the farming was given uh, zoning to construct, you um, know, a 10 story high building. So when the earthquake hit, it just got yeah it had nothing underneath it, it just liquefaction destroyed all foundation and boom they were all done for so uh, those kinds of uh, uh permits and money to be earned from all these construction projects the politics of changing zoning all of those converge toward disaster when engineers are not heard and uh, scientists are not heard and they're ignored for the sake of profit and that that is the price that they pay now will this lead to change well we've been through many earthquakes uh, as i said turkey is at the junction of these three major fault lines uh, Anatolian plate is being pushed west, so there's a, an earth, a, a fault line that runs east to west, right to Istanbul and farther west. And then this one that failed just recently uh, with the Arabian tectonic plate pushing into Anatolian plate. These uh, have been active, these have caused major earthquakes in the past, and I had you just shake your head and throw up your arms and say, you know, people have to be reminded over and over until they learn the lesson, but it's an expensive lesson to learn. Oh my gosh, that's for sure. With so many sadly lives lost during this. Um, on a better note, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad that you're, you're safe with um, your adventure across air, land, and sea so far. Yes. <laughs> More river cycling than you probably imagine. Um, but best wishes. I know you're getting your antenna to, uh, broken antenna to fix your, your rowboat and um, setting yes. off. I hope. Yes, that's supposed to arrive tomorrow. And hopefully I will install that and test it just fine uh, without any uh, further time lost waiting, then it's just going to be a matter of finding the right weather window to commit. Well, best wishes. And I hope whatever shore, I'm hoping for Vietnam. I think that's your yes. first choice, but wherever you land, I, um, I wish you well and look forward to maybe we could catch up when you um, next have a stop along the way. Always a thank pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, th thank you, Aaron, and it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me um, tonight for me today. Uh, good morning for you. Look forward yes. to catching up soon. Um, thanks for everyone for tuning in. If you enjoyed the conversation, please give us a like, subscribe to our channel. Thank you, Aaron. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Yay.